Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying your AWS reInvent so far. Show of hands. Yeah. Hey, there we go. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad to be here today to talk about hardware accelerated graphics, graphics desktop workspaces um, with you guys today. Actually, I'm just going to be an opening act. And I have the privilege and the honor to have great special guests that are going to join us soon on stage. We have Prakash, who is the vice president of IT at Autodesk. Jason, who leads events management at Autodesk. And we have Jason, who is the senior director of IT at TRC Solutions, which is a design and engineering company. So I'm really going to quickly do an intro about what the capabilities we provide in a graphics desktop and really hand it off to them to tell their stories and how graphics workspaces help their organization perform transformational things uh, for what they wanted to accomplish as business goals. So about a year and a half ago, customers came to me and the service team in general and asked us why couldn't we provide the same cloud scale economics that we offer today for end user computing, for task workers, productivity workers, and other category of use cases in, in general office productivity to the CAD 3D design, 3D engineering, animation kind of workloads. So in the past year, we've been working together with our customers, our partners, um, to really create that solution that gives you the, the ultimate scale and delivers a great user experience at a cost that you will love. So what to expect from this session? We will quickly talk about why GPU-based uh, desktops in AWS Cloud. We, talked, uh, we will cover a changing landscape of business and what is really prompting organizations to transform their IT function. This includes general desktop productivity and also things such as for designers and engineers and, and, and people who work with, on media kind of workloads. I'll give you a specification of what the graphics desktop provides you in terms of performance and compute and, and memory. I'll walk you through key benefits of what using graphics workspaces brings to your organization. And then I'll hand it off to Prakash, who is going to give you guys an overview of Autodesk and then... Um, Joel, who's going to give you an Autodesk, uh, overview of an Autodesk University and how Graphics Workspaces help them transform that conference that they have on a yearly basis with 10,000 plus users attending it, um, at least recently, a couple of weeks ago, here at the Venetian. We'll have Jason on stage talk about his customer case study with Graphics Workspaces and how it was transformational for his organization, and then we'll do a quick recap. Okay, so what were customers telling, telling, the, telling us when we, they wanted us to build a graphics desktop in the cloud? There were a couple of emerging trends. One is that there's this changing landscape of business, which is bringing in diverse work styles and a wide range of uh, capabilities that end users want and demanding from their IT organizations. People have, want to work anywhere on any device and not be sort of shackled by, by physical PCs or the limiting factor of having to go necessarily to an office to get their work done. That's an emerging trend in general business, but also applied to graphics-based workloads. Customers told us that they are actually uh, changing the way they procure for projects. These kind of workloads are really project-driven in a lot of organizations, and they really want to optimize the use of their investments to serve that project. The customers really want to bring consultants for a couple of months and be able to get a job done. And then when that job is done, they don't want to be in the business of managing hardware. So prior to the capabilities they, we provided, these customers used to rely on physical PCs or physical desktops, things that are hard to manage, hard to secure. So that project-based work really was a transformational movement for that kind of function in an organization, which prompted them to sort of ask for a service that would meet their needs. The other critical piece of feedback was we've already moved petabyte scale data into the AWS cloud. What prevents us to be able to be more productive and give our users a great experience is that their computing environment actually is far away from that. With graphics-based workspaces, your compute lives light feet away from your data, enhancing the overall user experience and actually making your users more productive. You can do all of this with a great security model because nothing leaves the AWS cloud. All the data in the, on your workspace stays on your workspace. There's no local data that you have to worry about. There's no security of local end devices that you have to worry about. 
the rendering, and all the actual computational work happens in the workspace, and that, that desktop experience, which we will demo in a bit, actually streamed down to a client device, a PC or IP0 client, low-cost hardware devices, or any other device, such as a Mac client, a desktop uh, PC, or a Chromebook, and it secures that data. Ultimately, what uh, organizations are looking for is to increase the user experience bar, lower their cost structure, and really be able to compete in this sub global world where agility is a key requirement for all ID functions and all organizations. How do we take the time back that we were doing in mundane operational tasks and give that back to the business? All these sort of competing priorities were challenges for our customers. So we worked on a graphics bundle for Amazon Workspaces. This graphics bundle provides the capabilities for en designers, engineers, people who are in the media industry to be able to do their work in the cloud in a secure fashion and save their organizations money in the type of workloads they want to bring. So let's talk about the actual specification, uh, specs. The display, we use an NVIDIA GPU that provides four gigabytes of memory on the GPU that has 1536 CUDA cores for computational purposes. Uh, it has eight vCPUs and 15 gigabytes of system memory, and 100 gigabytes of both storage and user volume as part of the bundle. The streaming technology that we use here is PC over IP, which has been tested and proven for our workspaces, which delivers a great experience at, at low bandwidth consumption. So some of the key benefits of this service, as I mentioned earlier, organizations are looking for the cloud scale economics that we provide for general office productivity applied to a graphics desktop. These, these include security. This includes a pay-as-you-go model. Not only are you paying for the instance, which is a physical instance and such, on by the hour, but you're also paying for the licenses in that fashion. So you're not constrained by that additional burden that IT function or organizations take when they want to do desktops. It's simple, meaning it's currently you have, we have APIs on our AWS management console, which customers are familiar with, and you can use the same exact tools to simply manage in a central fashion all your graphics-based desktops. And it all offers a consistent performance. And this is key, because your users aren't being compromised on performance. The specifications that I just listed is what each user will get. Also, this means that the workspaces that are, are in the AWS cloud also have a great internet connection. So performance of the actual compute, but also perf consistent performance of the network, which is key for a lot of our customers who have data transfers that they have to make sure and that gets managed properly. So this is a quick overview of graphics bundles that we offer at, with Amazon Workspaces. They provide our customers a lot of agility and the things that they've been asking for, uh, which we provide, had provided earlier for general office productivity for designers, engineers, and media entertainment industry. So with that, I'll actually invite Prakash to come on stage and walk you guys through what Autodesk and its vision is uh, with cloud computing and Amazon Workspaces. Thanks, Salman. All right, thanks, Salman. Uh, so what's Autodesk? I would say the first thing, as we mentioned there, the key goal for Autodesk vision is to help all people to uh, imagine, design, and create a better world. So what does this mean? If you have seen a high-performance car, or a skyscraper, or used a smartphone, or watched an animation movie, then you have experienced Autodesk. Because those creative work is done using Autodesk software. And that's what we try to do. We try to help our customers imagine, design, to create a better world. And uh, so I would say, uh, overall, this is just a high-level overview of what we do and what we are. We have over 200 million consumers that have used our software. And we have more than 150 softwares, products, that are on the cloud. Uh, and we migrated from our perpetual business to our subscription model on August 1st this year. So we were very serious about moving to the cloud. And we did a big switch this year, moving uh, to our subscription model. 
And if you look at our revenue, we are about $2.5 billion revenue uh, for the year which ended last uh, fiscal year, FY16. And then we have about 2.5 uh, million uh, subscription customers that are enrolled. And we are about 8,500 employees strong that create uh, the products that we have. Um, if you also look at the comparison of what we do, uh, if you take Amazon.com, they are one place, their vision is to be one place to, for customers to come and buy anything, and Google to come and search anything. And for Autodesk, we really want to be that one uh, company where people come to make anything. That's our vision of where we want to be. And so that's, that's high level what we, try, what we are trying to do. And um, again, the diversity of all the products that we have, taking from manufacturing to infrastructure projects to animation uh, for car industry, media and entertainment, we touch a wide variety of verticals and uh, several architects designers, uh, artists use our software to really create all those creative products that they are solutions that they want to create for their businesses. And we also have a lot of consumers uh, for uh, consumer products that use our software too. And th that's the high level of what we do as a company. And Autodesk University, this is very similar to uh, AWS reInvent where we uh, bring our customers to showcase what we have, what products we use, and what are the new capabilities and features that we are launching in that fiscal year, and for them to experience Autodesk products through labs, and through certification, get certification, and get the benefit uh, over a four-day uh, uh, four event, which actually took place two weeks back in the same place, where about 10,000 plus customers participated. And as an Autodesk IT organization working with product support team, we are responsible to make sure when customers come and experience these products, they have a cloud experience. That was our goal. As we are moving to the uh, cloud, we, have, uh, we wanted to deliver for this year, the first time, uh, all of those labs in the cloud. And that's where we partnered with Amazon for the first time for the entire event to take place. So over the last two years, we have been working with them, doing a couple of pilots, but we really wanted to make a big shift this year. Because when we are committed for all of our uh, customers that we are moving to the cloud, we wanted to make sure when they come to Autodesk University, they experience what, they, what it is going to be being a cloud customer. And so we took a big shift. And uh, Joel, who will uh, come after me, will talk about in detail how we achieved. So it actually uh, takes about. 20 plus engineers as a journey, I would say, uh, more than nine days, nine to 10 days around the clock, working in shifts to really set up these labs. And that's what our that was our state before. And that significantly changed by, moving, uh, uh, by working with Amazon and uh, moving all of our labs, exhibit halls, any workspaces that was there uh, into the cloud. And that's where it, we had a big uh, shift and we are able to scale, and we are able to launch most of the products, all of our desktop products, using their VDI capability, and uh, because a lo lot of our products require GPU, and that's where it becomes challenging. And what we used to do is install each of those products in diff all the labs and test it out. When you're doing it physically, you need to test every single machine and every single instance. And that's where, it, uh, at scale, it used to be a challenge. But we had a significant difference two weeks back where we had a successful uh, Autodesk University when we launched this. So I will uh, call upon Joel to really talk about how we did that, how we did that journey. And uh, he will also demo one of our products, which you will uh, be able to see how it looks. Jo Thank you. So, Autodesk University. Uh, my name is Joel St. Pierre. I'm actually Event Systems and Support Manager for Autodesk. My main event I work on every year is Autodesk University. Uh, the main task I do have is delivering our hands-on labs and certification. 
So this means uh, seven hands-on labs of 50 units, then we have a certification of 100, and then we do have additional work uh, devices uh, all over the event. So we did have a few challenges for AU Autodesk University 2016 versus our past years. So first challenges was actually time. So in the past, uh, as Prakash mentioned, we actually set up uh, the event in nine full days. And this year we actually had to move to a four day setup. So this means providing the same amount of labs and uh, physical workstations in four days. So it's kind of a challenge here because you're moving all of this nine days into four days. So for me, it's either I deliver these or I basically lose my job. So option one is I make AU 16 in four days. Option B is go back home to Montreal and open up my uh, burger and poutine joint. So I did not like that idea, idea too much. So I'm actually going to give an overview of how we uh, delivered AU in the past years with physical devices. So the main part of it was actual 10 physical servers we had, so HP ProLiant uh, server, server blades that we had. And two of those are uh, domain controllers. We had AD on those devices as well. And we had uh, our main SCCM uh, head on that and, de and deploy endpoints on that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what SCCM is, probably, most likely. So uh, System Center Configuration Manager uh, product from, uh, from Microsoft. And this allows us to do a lot of things. Uh, for us, we mostly use it for imaging and deploying our, our own software and third-party software as well in those labs. So we actually end up installing, I'd say, more than 100 of our, of our software and 30 different 30 third-party software in those labs. So it takes a lot of time. The prep time is usually three months before the show where we get the software requirements from our speakers, and then I have to package that, uh, test it, deploy it on physical devices, make sure that, that all these software work well with one another, which tend to be a challenge. So, and those requirements I would actually change throughout those three months. So, and then we don't have the luxury of having, uh, in this case, 500 identical workstations. So you're dealing with hardware from different vendors, different graphics card. So you have to make sure that you have all the drivers for all of these, that. Uh, that basically your images are working on each. So for this, you can only be testing uh, a few devices before the show, but on site, you do get the bad surprises of troubleshooting hardware, which was our main pain point for, uh, for AU in the past year is where you get 500 devices, you, you box, box them out, you actually need to put them on the tables, plug them in, and then you realize that, oh, this one does not have a graphics card. So you're pretty much stuck there. You have to order more, uh, actually put them in the systems, then go through bio settings, make sure that uh, everything is set up. Pixie is enabled for SCCM. So we actually spent multiple hours out of those nine days actually troubleshooting hardware, which is not ideal for us. There we go. So uh, before we, I actually talk about what is AU now with AWS, I'm actually gonna give you a brief history of what we've done in the past years. So for sure, uh, cloud doesn't happen overnight. So you can't just say uh, this year we're going from 50, 500 physical workstations to 500 workstations in the cloud. That's pretty impossible. So what actually happened is it, uh, right before AU 2014, uh, uh, some people from Amazon, uh, in this case was Steve Bueller, Tosh Tambay, and uh, Michael Garza came up to me and they said, uh, we'd like to showcase our, our EC2, uh, EC2 GPU instances at AU. So I was like, I don't know. I don't know this technology. I'm a bit un at ease, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. So instead of actually doing at full scale, we actually just took one room, uh, one lab of 50 units and picked two classes out of those, which were Revit classes. So we just isolated this to one software and see how can this work uh, at, at this scale? So we had those on actual physical devices, so, not, uh, so nothing that's uh, zero at that point. And so if something did go wrong, we could actually fall back to those physical devices and keep, uh, keep the experience going on for our lab users. So that was a great success. Uh, I was very happy about it. We got great feedback from our, our customers, and some we, I'd say we didn't get feedback because they didn't know that we were actually running on the cloud, So which is good in this case. So we decided to expand for AU 2015, and we decided to bring those 50 units to 100. So we isolated one of our labs, uh, which is typically 50 units. So we did 50 physical workstations. We're uh, running the Teradici PC over IP client, and 50 that were actually zero clients. 
So we had, uh, we doubled the scale from 50 to 100, and in this case, we ran all of our labs from that room on, on, a, on AWS. So we had, uh, I'd say, over 35 different Autodesk software. And once again, it delivered, it was really good. Uh, it was a seamless experience. Uh, people thought they were on physical devices, which is what we wanted. So this brings us to, uh, I'd say, the wrap-up of, uh, wrap of AU2015. I was actually sitting in our, our war room with uh, Steve Mueller from uh, AWS, and he said, Joel, what do you think, let's say we do this full scale next year? And I'm like, I was thinking that already. So this brings us to AU2016 this year, where we said, let's bring all of our labs, so seven labs of 50 units, uh, one certification lab of 100, and then we actually had uh, we actually had devices across the floor on the exhibit hall, our answer bar as well. So that brings us to right about uh, 500 units. So this is uh, so this is AU 2016. So why are we going to the cloud? Uh, cloud is the new normal for Aut for Autodesk. So we actually have software offerings right now that are in the cloud. So we've got Fusion 360, BIM 360. AutoCAD 360 and Shotgun. So we're slowly moving our software to the cloud. So it just makes sense for us as a software company to be pioneering in this and actually moving AU to the cloud. And as I said just before, we did multiple pilots. So it's not like we had this happen overnight. We did AU 2014, 2015, great success. So no reason why we cannot bring this up to a, a greater scale. And then the low risk profile. So you guys are all here this week. You've probably seen the hands-on labs. Uh, right next door and the certification downstairs and they're all on workspaces right now so if amazon can can trust it we can trust it as well so that's why we we felt that we could actually do this for 2016 and then again the scale of it we can actually easily go from in this case we went to 50 100 500 and we can actually go even bigger if we want uh, very easily with aws so AU uh, with AWS right now. So we actually, to so compare it to before where we had 10 physical servers, and now we only have, in this case, was one laptop running the AWS console. So you have AD is in is it, uh, AWS, you got your domain in the cloud, imaging in the cloud, so you don't have to carry around, uh, for this case, was shipping our service from Montreal office down to back to Las Vegas. And, you know, what could happen is that they don't make it or they come in in a bad state. Yes, we do have backups, but then you have to take that, that restoring those backups in our, our four-day uh, four window, which is not really viable for us. So this is really great uh, working with AWS and having everything in the cloud, and we actually image all of our software prior to coming to AU. So when we came here, it was actually just uh, logging into those workspaces and you're good to go. So I talked earlier about uh, troubleshooting hardware. This was not an issue this year. We were running uh, with uh, PC over IP zero clients, and this means that since it's just such small devices, there's a lot less uh, parts to break. So, and let's say it does break for some reason, you just swap it out for a new one, and compared to a workstation that you're paying, let's say, right around five grand for, you go to $300. So it's, it's, a, it's a good exchange, you know? So it's pretty, it's very less expensive, and as well, less power requirements, so you're saving on power as well. So one big question you guys are maybe asking yourselves is, internet, what do I need? How much bandwidth do I actually need to deliver this amount of, uh, of workspaces. So in our case, we actually had uh, two ISPs. Uh, we had two drops of one gig each. And these are the graphs from last week. So this was actually two weeks ago that we had. And you can see that we never actually went over that one gig. So the average for uh, overall that we used was 185 megabytes per, per second. And then for per workspaces, it was dot four megabytes per second as average. So that's really low. So you see how uh, how low the requirements are from network with using workspaces. So I guess what well, we see the proof is in the pudding. So I'm actually going to switch here for a quick software demo. Don't expect anything mind blowing. I'm not a software specialist, so I'm just going to switch the input here to a zero client. There we go. Close this out. So in this case, we have Revit. 
you can see that I can easily come here and move my scene around, rotate, works really well. I can go in here and I guess I could, can I take this out? Yeah, I can remove the roof so I can actually go back here, zoom in. No, the performance is as if you were on a physical workstation. So this is uh, our Revit software from Autodesk, and then we can move here. I have 3ds Max open, so you can see here our for any 3ds Max users that might be here today, the classic uh, teapot from 3ds Max. I actually can go here again. I'll just orbit it because I can't do much anything fascinating here for you guys today. But this is just to prove to you guys that you're. It's kind of like it's your physical workstation, but you're in the cloud, and you can get the same performance across the board. So swapping back to our slide deck. Right, there we go. So I just want to conclude. So things we did learn from this is how easy it is to scale. So we went, again, from 50, 100 to 500. We could easily go to 1,000 uh, and actually be able to deploy that in the same amount of time. So simple to deploy and manage. So you have uh, your Active Directory and domain in the cloud. You can uh, deploy software in the cloud, which is great. So you don't need to bring your physical devices on site. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier, we had a certification lab of 100 devices. And in the past, what was a big problem was heat dispersion. And so people are already stressed out doing their certification. And the workstation produced a lot, a lot, a lot of heat. People are sweating. This year with zero clients, you have no heat dispersion at all. It's very quiet, so people are more focused on the exam. And it, since there's less heat dispersion, it was actually pretty, pretty cold. You probably can see the same thing this week in the hands-on labs. It's pretty cold. And one thing, a consistent performance to what Salman was saying earlier, is uh, you get the same performance across the board. So our 100 uh, uh, workspaces for the certification lab had the same specs. So everyone in that room has the same chance as to pass their exam than the other. So this is something that we, that's really great coming out of workspaces. And as well, AU is a green event, so uh, we're reducing our carbon footprint since we're not shipping out as much hardware. And as well, uh, same thing for power requirements as well. So in and, and the end, saving money there. So one thing I actually learned yesterday from my manager sitting right there is that AU 2020, we're actually moving from a four-day setup to a two-day setup. <laughs> so you can see how, for us, the only solution moving forward is uh, the AWS Cloud. So I think that's all I have to say today. I'd like to thank everyone for your time. Thanks, Joel, and thanks, Prakash. I think that story is really telling how they had a business need, and in order to accomplish that, they had to be dynamic and agile in their functions, and they were able to use Amazon Workspaces to go and deliver that solution and be successful. I look, I look forward and continue to look forward to working with that team and helping a 2020 vision. I will be asking for swag, like sweaters or hoodies, so that when I'm at their certification labs, I'm not super cold. But besides that, I think it'll be a great working relationship. And this is something that's core and central to what we do at AWS. We work with our partners and customers closely. We listen to their feedback, and we continue to iterate on that to make things better for them. So I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would want to introduce to you on stage Jason. Jason is a senior director of IT at TRC Solutions, which is a design and engineering company. They were one of the very first customers who joined the beta and have been instrumental in helping the service make it better. So I really appreciate that, Jason. And so I'll just hand it off to you, Jason. Thank you. All right. I know there is uh, beer, I think, waiting for us this last session of the day. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But really quickly, I want to mention, Joel, your beard. That's great. <laughs> I like that. That's a good job. I am not blessed in that way. So yeah, we're, uh, <laughs> my company is called TRC, and uh, we're, we're probably haven't, probably not many have heard of us, but we're a design engineering company. We've been around since 1969, but one of the interesting things about TRC is we've grown through acquisition quite a bit, um, and in one of the cases, and one I'll, I'll probably speak to most here, is the oil and gas sector, which we um, acquired uh, late last year. Uh, which is from an older company called Wilbros. It's a 100-year-old organization. So those are the kind of people we have in our organization, people who have been there for a long time. 
and they're all engineers, and they're all drafters, and they've, you know, there's guys in the field, and, 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 and that's kind of my users, right? My users aren't technology experts like Autodesk and software engineers. I mean, they're muddy boots and hard hats, and, and that's what we do. So um, we're, we're around 120 offices here in the US, and uh, we've got one in the UK, and then around 4,100 employees dispersed across all those offices. So some offices, five or six people, some of them 100 people. I mean, they're just really dispersed everywhere. And then really the point of doing so is getting us closer to our customers and closer to um, you know, where the work is, frankly. Uh, we focus on these other sectors, uh, energy, so uh, permitting and land, uh, land services for um, environmental nature, like think about BP oil spill and, and things like that. Like we help remediate those kind of things, but then doing permitting and planning and, uh, for, for engineering services. Um, Infrastructure, so roads, bridges, and highways, and then oil and gas, we, we do a lot of engineering for uh, pipeline and, and facilities. One of those such things would be like this, and, and this, is a, this is a compressor station we've uh, developed with one of our customers. Um, compressor stations help push gas, oil and gas, through pipelines to make a, you know, get from point A to point B. And then you see the things on the left there, you know, you've got things like uh, pig launchers uh, and receivers and, and metering stations and all these sort of things going on. And this is a, a great 3D model. It's not a house or a teapot, but it's, um, this is the kind of stuff we work on, right? And, uh, and it could be anywhere. And these, these design models can get rather large. We could have elect electrical and hydraulics and mechanical and all sorts of drafting and engineering design going into this. Um, that presents a lot of interesting challenges uh, for our business. I'm focused a lot on oil and gas, so we're, we're going to talk about that here. Uh, what you see on the right there is uh, the oil and gas uh, price of oil you know, per barrel uh, for the last, or for quite some time. Uh, luckily this week, it does look like OPEC is going to start reducing, reduc or reducing production, and that should help this, right? But there's a lot of things that go into the price of oil and gas, right? It could be su just supply and demand, which is what we've seen right now. We've seen a, a major uptick in supply, which drops demand, and uh, uh, you know, commodity prices are pretty elastic. Uh, but also geopolitical, you see wars, and you see you know, people not wanting trade embargoes and those kind of things, and those get in the way of, of cheap fuel uh, that keeps us warm in the winter, or runs in our cars, or even runs, you know, uh, keeps the lights on in a lot of cases as well. Also, regulations come out a lot. You see a lot of issues with uh, companies that will have um, unfortunate accidents, uh, like in the Gulf or, or in uh, San Ramon with uh, PG&E, and, and those things happen. It, it's really unfortunate, or, or we see what's happening with Dapple in North Dakota right now. These are, these are bad things, right? These are bad publicity. It's very political. But all of those things impact the price of oil uh, and the price of gas. Um, and what happens in, when you're in technology and working in IT in these groups is you're in this position of kind of making a bet. And that bet is that we're going to need this amount of capacity, of course, right? We're, we're going to go buy something, and we're going to depreciate it over three years, and, and we just have to own that asset, and we have to have it for so much time. And when the, on the uptick, it's no problem, right? On the, when those graphs go up, CFO will write you a check for nearly anything. It's kind of nice. But when they go down, it's really not the case, right? You, you, you have to beg, and you have to plead, and, and there's a value proposition of somebody saying, do we need a tractor or trucks or, or these other things, or do we need to buy new servers and data centers and expand these kind of things? And those are real conversations that we have in our company all the time. So we've got this problem uh, of elastic market that, that we can't really support um, efficiently using this traditional kind of CapEx model. Some of the other challenges we have, uh, software consistency is a problem where you've got um, 120 offices and some people have certain versions of software and some people have other versions of software. You know, which one's right and you want to collaborate and send files back and forth, that doesn't work well. Um, you also have distributed skills. You could have people um, in Denver, Colorado who are really bright, know how to use Autodesk services or software really well, uh, and then they need to help collaborate on something in, in Tulsa or Houston or, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, and these kind of things. So you've got distributed skills, and sharing data between those isn't, isn't great. But on that sharing data, data accessibility with subcontractors where you might want to let them collaborate on a design or drawing. Or maybe you're just regionally, you want to you know, share work between Denver and Houston. It's not easy to do. Uh, you know, we're a TNM based business, so we, we rate ourselves on utilization, right? Hours of billable work. Um, it's just how our business works. So billing to overhead is bad. So you could have this uptick of, of, uh, of work in Houston, right? But, but Denver's sitting on work, and, and you know, collaborating on design files is not you know, overly easy. 
But then also out of the office, what if I'm just at home, I got a sick kid or those kind of things, you can't enable those things. You just, there's no great way to take a $5,000 workspace or workstation and, and make that happen at Starbucks or, or, or make it happen at somebody's home. Uh, certainly we've done it, uh, we're an older company, we've done it, done it, we don't like doing it, but it does happen. So some of our journey, uh, we, we knew this is a problem, this has been a problem in this industry for quite some time. Um, so the status quo is kind of just copying files, right? Like, hey, here's a set of files, go work on it. We have to, these things called XREFs, and you gotta worry about, you know, make sure nothing's going over the WAN, and you need to make sure that, you know, all of the, uh, the features of the file get the copied over, and that's really how it works. Um, that's bandwidth intensive, your very bursty workloads, you're copying, you know, gigs of data across the LAN. I mean, it, take, it can happen, it gets done, it's not impossible, but it's a pain. Other problems with that is certainly the, the underscore version one, underscore final, dot, you know, whatever problem. That, that happens, right? And who's got the right version and we're on version two final or is it version three final or version one final? Who knows, right? You create this big data management problem and that's not a, a great way to solve it. So one of the things we said was, well, what if we just make all the data available everywhere, right? Everybody's got it. We just start shipping it back and forth. Maybe we could get a, snowmobile and just start shipping this data all over. I would love to be on that, but um, we, we, uh, we would not fill that up. But we, <laughs> but, um, but we thought about this. We thought about how could we just replicate the data everywhere, put it everywhere it needs to be. We thought about doing it, maybe not all of data, just a subset of data for the projects that we need to collaborate on. Uh, and then for other projects, you know, we just keep it localized if you don't need to collaborate. There's some strategic problems or, you know, in doing that, you, you, um, or tactical problems, I guess, was you, you might have utilization or resources available in one site and then you lose them, another project comes in, you know, or, or you know, layoffs happen or, or whatever happens and, and, and now you need to you know, move and burst out to another site to take advantage of some of their utilization. This could work, we could solve the problem, right? We could start moving data everywhere it's not really improving anything, it doesn't change anything, it costs a whole lot of money. Uh, we've definitely looked at this, um, it can work, but replicating SANS or using NASs and those kind of things, uh, you know, it, it will definitely work and we can definitely support it, uh, but we thought there's just gotta be a better way. One of the things that happens as we go through this, and this doesn't just happen, but one of the things that would happen is we would have this opportunity where we needed this one particular designer engineer to look at something across, uh, you know, in Denver or, or Seattle or wherever they're at. And we would absolutely just like remote in and have a look at it. So we already saw this kind of working. We would put, you know, graphics workstations in data centers and have people remote to them and try it out. And we knew that kind of worked and we thought this is really kind of interesting. But, but what's really interesting is doing this in the cloud, right? And, and that's obviously why I'm up here today and, and holding you from your beers or wine, whichever. But, so we decided to, let's try it. Let's just push it out there, let's see what happens. We're gonna, we're gonna take a couple projects, we're gonna throw them out there, and we did that. We launched uh, around 25 workspaces uh, in about a week. That week also included like training people, getting it launched, and when I say we, it was really uh, Brett Tatum back there uh, doing most of this work, training people, getting them up and running, installing the software, building the bundles, and sure enough, we're up and running, and it just kind of worked. Um, so how did that work? Um, some of the outcomes that we saw first were uh, we wanted to make sure they were measurable. We wanted to make sure that we, it wasn't just it felt good or it looked cool, it was a sexy kind of way of operating. We needed to kind of measure this and see did it actually work, did it make a difference at all. See, there's, these are some of our basic uh, packages we knew we could measure. Things like generating alignment sheets. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that is, don't worry about it. If you Google it, you probably won't find anything unless you're in our industry. But, but these are things that we, we do all the time and we generate, it's a batch processing job that we can, we can build and, and throw out. And, and, and you can see some of these metrics. And what's great about these metrics is it, it not only helps us do our jobs, it helps people be less frustrated doing their jobs when they click and wait and then get back into their job. Or if they, you know, if they, you know, they click and go get a cup of coffee or go get a sandwich or any of these kind of things, it's not good, it's not productive, it's also not billable, right? And, and that's really one of the things we strive to, you know, obviously increase our utilization. But in a down market, this also matters because we can effectively lower our costs to our customers. 
And that makes a big difference in a down market. Supply chains are taking over in oil and gas as well as other industries. And certainly we have to be as competitive on our business as we can be. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, immediately we saw margin improvement in a lot of our projects, but then also we were able to lower our rates and extend some of these value back to our customers. And that's what's most exciting to, to the leadership because we could created a real competitive difference just by doing, these are some, there's others on there that were probably even more obscure to you. But one of the other things we've done that's interesting is this is a graph of our Amazon costs, but not really. Um, I didn't feel comfortable sharing it, so I didn't. But um, one of the things we've done is you can tag workspaces, right? And you can, you can say this is the project we're using it on. And, and by doing that, you can then in Cost Explorer see what projects are using what resources. And we said, all right, let's build that directly to a project. Just like we would, you know, if, you, if you're working on a project and you spend an hour, you also have an hour of workspaces time built to that project. Just like if you were renting a car or renting a, a piece of survey equipment or these kind of things, this, this happens all the time. It's a very normal thing for project managers to think about it, but it was never very uh, obvious for computing resources because that's just a different way of working. Um, it was really troublesome. Project managers hated it because it immediate, immediately erodes their margins, right? You know, their project margins would start to go down because we're billing things we wouldn't typically bill to the customer. However, at the business unit line, we completely changed, right? There's no reallocation of cost to buy works, uh, workstations and servers and things like that. We can just bill it straight to the project. What's interesting about in this graph was <laughs> the best I came up with, but some of the projects, they'll last two weeks, you know, just come in, look at this, design it, do something, you know, make this modification, and then the project's over. Uh, and, or some projects could last six months, or a year, or three years, or, or, or whatever it is, right? And when those, the project's over, the costs stop coming in, and when the, you know, if we need to scale back up and add, you know, 50 users, we can just do that. And it's not a huge deal for me, because I don't have to do it. But, <laughs> but certainly, my team doesn't get overly worried about it. You know, we just click and launch and, and, and have people log in. So that elasticity of how our business is doing has been really interesting to kind of see what happens. Some of the, the things that happen as part of that, we'll talk about uh, really quickly the, the kind of third and fourth bullets there, but our project managers started to collaborate with IT, right? They would come to us and say, we have this need, here's the project, we want to grow the environment, we want to add users. Previously, they would say, We've got a big project, we don't know how big it is, right? It could be three terabytes, they don't even know what terabytes means, you know, they don't have a good measure of these kind of things, um, but they would say, we just need it. And IT would, you know, through a reallocation model, figure out how to charge that back to the business unit, all of that kind of goes away, and it creates, a, the PM is now in a position to manage cost of their project completely. But we also, through doing so, gets a, we get alignment with, with the business, the project managers and, and people like that, because now we are part of the project. IT is empowered to help design solutions for that particular use case. We could have a large job that we want to share with subcontractors or, or a large job we want to share just internally. Um, we can now do so, and that alignment and working with our project management staff to help drive some of these solutions, we're part of the conversation now, and it feels really cool to not just worry about this traditional day-to-day -day IT work, but actually help the business execute projects and do project execution. I mentioned the performance, and I mentioned the elastic cost, and, and those have been really great things, but, but also we've, we stumbled across some quality benefits in, in doing this as well, and, and what that looks like is sometimes sites would have their own way of working and their own ways of delivering data to customers or, or internally. But when you centralize it, and they're all collaborating on the same design files and the same engineering files, it inherently makes them consistent. And that's kind of an interesting byproduct of, of just working in this, we hadn't thought about it. We're not done, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, so moving forward, uh, we're looking to integrate um, using some of these APIs. We started building an interface so that HR can, my team doesn't have to get involved to, to launch a workspace. We can just instantiate it from a workflow from ServiceNow or, or, or just building our own interface and then they can do their own reporting. We don't have to get involved in that just by querying the APIs. Building some of these bundles to make sure different versions of AutoCAD or, or, or whatever software works um, as needed. But one of the great things is we're not buying workstations anymore. I mean, it's early days, we believe this to be true, but we're in a position of not having to buy 
$5,000 to $8,000 workstations uh, and deploying those and hopefully we have that resource or people to fill that seat for, for the next uh, three years, who knows. Um, but we also move, uh, changes our data management structures for project archives and, and moving to S3 and Glacier. We've enabled those things. Removing VPN, it's kind of funny to think, but we still use a lot of VPN, and, and the thought process is that you don't really need that. You know, you, you encrypt from the client to, to workspaces, and that, that's great. And in fact, we could improve upon that just by adding MFA. There's a lot of work to do, uh, but we're really excited about the, the current potential uh, and, and the trajectory that we're on. So, you know, in closing, I'd mention that, you know, we're an elastic market, and I'm sure we're not alone in that by any means. Um, but, but now we can effectively manage our elasticity of our IT infrastructure back to the business in the way we need. One of the great things I just want to close on is the statement that can't imagine going back. One of our major critics that's been around this business for a long time had said, you know, this will never work. What are you talking about? Of course not, right? I mean, all these things, there was all these older engineers or engineers. I married an engineer. I was kind of... But, but you know, looking back, he started to say, you know what? I can't imagine going back. It, it's really not hard. It wasn't a major change to our infrastructure, or, or and he didn't say the word infrastructure, to our environment and, and working in that way. And, and that felt great to think about that we've implemented something that, that they just they can use and, and it wasn't a pain for them and, and they can't imagine working in any other way. So I appreciate you, Salman. You can come on up and I guess we can take Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, that, and I've been working with Jason for quite some time, so I, under, I really, really appreciate his story and this journey from physical to the cloud. And uh, with Autodesk and with Jason, I will continue to make sure that we add the added benefits that they look for to continue the journey and, and make it simple and easy for them. So I just want to thank the crowd. I hope you got, got have some key takeaways from this session, how graphics desktops in the cloud with the visualization technology we have can deliver a great user experience, simplify your overall desktop administration, save your business money while improving and meeting goals. I mean, in the case of Jason, his IT function transformed the business. It's usually the other way around. Business leads the IT function, but his IT function changed the business. So it's a pretty great story, and I'm appreciative of Jason to come up on stage and talk about it. Once again, thank you uh, for, for joining the session. We will have about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, but before you leave, please remember to complete your evaluations. This help us improve as well. So I'll, I'll actually take some Q&A um, when we're done with the session right outside the hall. So if you have any questions, we just have that there. Thank you so much.